All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, back, back with Josh and Paul and Deirdre Gifford, who you know uh, are from Public Health, as well as uh, Department of Social Services on the health implications of what we're trying to do. And Miguel Cardona, our great um, Commissioner of Education. Since today, we want to talk to you a little bit about uh, probably one of the most complicated pieces of the reopening, reopening K through 12 and reopening K through 12, making plans a good two months in advance. And we've seen what a difference two months can make. Uh, very quickly on our daily summary, um, the good news is this is not a big difference from where we've been over the last uh, uh, few weeks. Uh, our numbers are consistent and our numbers are uh, getting better. Uh, and uh, the most important metric again is the positive cases as a percent of tests informed performed, and that's 1.2 percent. And um, I think over the last week or two, we've learned not to take that number uh, for granted. Uh, Max? The next slide, I think, gives you uh, an indication of where we are in the country right now. And it does tell you that um, things have gotten worse in most of the country. That's why we made the decisions we did yesterday regarding the quarantine, uh, along with our friends from New Jersey and New York. Uh, we may talk about that later. But you can see on this um, uh, uh, chart from uh, Johns Hopkins, those states that are on fire, they're in red. Those that have uh, had a better than 50 percent increase in cases uh, in, a, in a week. And then uh, fortunately, Connecticut has had a 50 percent decrease in uh, cases um, uh, uh, week to week. And that's made an, an enormous difference. But we cannot take that for granted. And that is what has made um, planning for the K through 12 uh, school year uh, complicated and all the more important. I'm just going to give you some of my broad um, goals as I discussed this with Miguel, who has discussed our reopening strategy with everybody. Uh, that's uh, teachers, parents, um, students, principals, um, getting all the input we can to come up with a, um, a, a solution that uh, makes sense uh, for each and every one of you. And uh, my number one principle metric was the public health lens. Uh, just like we said about reopening our businesses, nothing makes any sense unless people uh, feel like they're safe and they are safe. And that was uh, priority number one, two, and three as we uh, give you confidence that we can reopen the schools safely, comma, provided COVID behaves. Uh, my second um, priority is education. Our kids have not been in the classroom for um, you know, months now. And this is a, uh, a long break, and they're coming back in August and September. And uh, for us, um, making sure we had a, as a close to a traditional classroom experience as we could for these kids, especially K through eight, was just uh, an important priority for the teachers, parents, and uh, Miguel and myself. We'll talk about that. And thirdly, I wanted to make sure we had a, a class day and a class week that was um, something that employers could uh, bank upon for their employees so they knew what the uh, schedule would be and allow our state to get back to work. So, I'll, you know, I'll start with what we decided within those broad principles. Uh, number one, we wanted to have the school year start uh, as close to possible at the normal time. We wanted to have as close to possible a normal school day and a normal school week. And um, that was um, A, for the sense of consistency it gave for each and every one of the kids, a sense of tradition coming back. And also it allows employers to be able to plan in terms of what the work day is and uh, who can be able to do the work when. Um, I would say that uh, we also thought a lot about do you regionalize this, you do it by district. And just like we did the rest of our reopening, um, I think uh, Miguel and myself, we thought it was best to do this on a statewide basis. We wanted to have some consistency across all 169 of our towns. Uh, we wanted to do that, A, for the sake of um, making sure the uh, quality of the experience and, uh, was, was consistent for everybody. And also, so, that you, um, so again, employers would not have people with different hours and different days, uh, one district to the next and to make sure we had that equality of opportunity for all of our kids. 
Um, next thing we had to think about is if we're going to work within the normal school day as best as possible, because we thought about having mornings and afternoon sessions or Tuesdays and Thursdays, but have a five-day normal school week, um, how could we do that within the um, existing school um, classrooms? And we thought about the number of people in a classroom, the number of desks in a classroom, and all facing forward, and how many people would be in there. And uh, Miguel will talk about um, the metrics we'd use as we thought about that. We've had to think a little bit about, um, will everybody want to come back to school? Will some percentage of parents maybe not want their kids going back to school? Or do some kids have a pre-existing condition where they shouldn't go back to school? And then um, it was sort of interesting for me finding out there's a real difference in the size of classrooms as well between um, you know, pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, generally more space per child than a lot of the other grades, and they also have their own private bathrooms. So these all went into the metrics in terms of classroom. But then um, something else uh, pricked my imagination, our imagination. We heard from all of our public health experts. They said, you know, just as important or even probably more important then the number of kids in that class, whether it's 18 or 26, is less important than the fact that they cohort together. And what that means is they wanted that fifth grade class to stay as a group and, uh, and stay as a group so they didn't have to walk around the hallways, go to other classes. So if there was, um, God forbid, an infection, you know who those 25 uh, you know, kids and that teacher is, and, uh, and that's more self-contained. You know, obviously during recess, when you're outside, there's more room for socialization. But that cohorting idea really helped us focus on the ability to have a, a K through 12 education that was pretty consistent in terms of a normal school day and a normal school week. Um, a little more complicated maybe, K through 8 cohorting is easier. High school a little more complicated because you are going from class to class. And Miguel can talk a little bit about how we're trying to address that. So in introducing Miguel, I just want you to know that um, he has worked with everybody. He comes uh, as a teacher himself, uh, superintendent, deputy superintendent of schools, and uh, obviously now our commissioner of education. And he has talked to thousands of people. And he's uh, pre-circulated this with a lot of our superintendents, spent hours with the teachers, reaching out to uh, parents and educators, as well as the legislators, because everybody has a strong point of view about education and how we can do this uh, safely. And what he's doing is based upon the presentation he'll give you, is that will then be um, sent to each of the districts, each of the superintendents. They'll have some time to socialize that, some time to see how our metrics fit within that particular school, that particular school building, where there may be some ancillary space as uh, they need it come up with a preliminary idea of what the budget implications of this would be so they can get back to us in a month or so and we can start um, putting uh, words to paper in a very specific way oriented towards an on-time uh, school startup. You know, with that, uh, Miguel, um, over to you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor Lamont. And thank you, teachers, principals, superintendents, families, and most importantly, the students of Connecticut for their work with remote learning these last three months. I was in awe with what you were able to do and accomplish. You made us all proud. Congratulations to the class of 2020. A special thank you to the custodians and facilities crew as well as the food service and cafeteria staff who served over eight million meals over the last three months. You kept Connecticut going. I also want to acknowledge the dedicated team at the State Department of Education who've worked 24 seven to prepare what I'll be sharing today. We've been working tirelessly to develop a reopening plan for Connecticut for the last few months. As you might imagine, developing a plan for school reopening that predicts where we will be as a state in terms of COVID spread in two months is extremely challenging, but we are pleased to have a plan for Connecticut that promotes health and safety for our students and staff. First slide, please. While we're in the health pandemic, it's important to recognize that we're also in an educational emergency. While efforts to provide computers and internet access is important, and efforts of teachers and school leaders to provide quality remote learning was nothing less than heroic, we heard loud and clear that students wanted to get back to school. 
To prepare for reopening, we listened. We had educational partners such as superintendents, principals, teachers, parents, and students share their thoughts, and they influenced the development of the plan. Through meetings and surveys, we heard from thousands of Connecticut residents and students. We also worked very closely with our partners at the Department of Public Health to get input and direction from health experts. We acknowledge and embrace the opportunity to bring students back, but also support them as they deal with the trauma of separation, seclusion, loss, and effects of racial tensions and ignorance that plague our country. While the challenge ahead of us is greater than any educator has experienced in our lifetimes, we've also seen educators rise masterfully to the challenge three months ago. We know there are no easy answers and nothing will be set in stone. We're prepared to serve our students and adapt as needed. In this, we'll keep student physical, social, emotional, and academic well-being at the forefront of our decisions. This school year was marked with disruption. Next school year will be marked with innovation and commitment. It will be our most important year as educators. Before giving you details of the plan, it's important to acknowledge that Connecticut's progress with reducing the spread of COVID in Connecticut, as the governor pre previously mentioned. In many indicators, Connecticut is performing best. Thank you to the Connecticut residents who have adhered to the mitigation strategies. It's because of those efforts that we can plan to have students return. We must not lose sight of the fact that our continued success will determine our fall reopening strategy. Next slide, please. Our guiding principles are to safeguard health and safety, provide in-school opportunities for all students in a consistent way, as the governor mentioned, monitor health trends and adjust as necessary, promote equity and access, and maintain an ear to the ground to be responsive and consider the negative effects of not being in school, both uh, because students are less likely to be in a structured environment if they're out, but also the social and emotional well-being of students when they're not in school. Next slide, please. Given the health, uh, the Connecticut health data as of today, districts should plan for a fall reopening for all students every day. To do this, they must employ maximized social distancing. That means that desks should be moved as far away from each other. Um, we should look at every corner of the classroom and spread it out to allow for maximum social distancing. Frequent hand washing, so when students are leaving or transitioning, coming in from outside, they should wash their hands. When they're done eating, they should wash their hands. Um, we should note that part of Connecticut's plan is to require the use of face coverings that cover the nose and mouth for students and staff. And we're also going to promote enhanced cleaning and disinfecting measures of space and areas where there's high traffic. Next slide, please. For the classrooms and the buses, we are emphasizing cohorting, which means every grouping, uh, wherever possible, grouping students by the same class or group. Um, so that each team functions independently from others as much as possible. K and A, K through A is when it's uh, most likely to be possible in high schools. We're promoting uh, wherever that's possible. Sometimes you can do ninth grade teams. Other times uh, you can't do it. So what we're saying in high schools, the emphasis of uh, masks is, is a strong mitigating factor and social distancing as much as possible in the classrooms as well. Social distancing and facilities. We're going to be reviewing in a systematic way, building space and reconfiguring space uh, and using gymnasiums, auditoriums to maximize social distancing. For transportation, districts should plan for buses to operate close to capacity with heightened health and safety protocols, including requiring that all students and operators wear face covering. Increased social distancing protocols will be activated based on, upon community spread. So if there's an increase, there will be an increase in uh, social distance requirements. As I mentioned earlier, face coverings, all staff and students will be expected to wear a protective face covering or face mask that completely covers the nose and mouth when inside the school building, except for certain cases where teachers are providing instruction with additional social distancing or where there is a medical exemption. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, Connecticut's positive trends allow us to plan for reopening schools in a manner that brings students back daily. Districts should also prepare for a potential uptick in community transmission and develop alternative plans that reduce the percentage of students that are entering at any given time. 
Ultimately, if health data requires, we should also be prepared to return to an improved method of remote learning. We're prioritizing the acquisition of devices, connectivity, and quality content to support these efforts. A comprehensive document will be shared publicly on Monday that identifies how districts can consistently benchmark when to ramp down school plans based on COVID spread. Consistency matters. Next slide. This plan is submitted as the beginning of our reopening process. What we've learned is that we must remain flexible and responsive to the data and changing understanding of mitigation strategies and virus spread. We continue to learn. The next step is to hear from districts and educational partners to provide te technical support and to continue to work with our partners at the Department of Public Health to inform our decisions. As I said, a comprehensive document will be forthcoming on Monday with more information in areas of academics, remote learning, standards, equity, social emotional tools for our districts, and other information that will be helpful in planning our reopening. We will continue to receive input from our educational partners, students, and families as we work together toward providing the best opportunities for Connecticut's greatest resources, our students. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, Miguel. And um, remember, Deirdre and Josh are on virtually as well. Max, over to you. NBC Connecticut. Hi, Governor. Matt Austin with NBC Connecticut. Earlier this year, we saw quite a few schools close after suspected or possible coronavirus cases with students or also educators. How will that be handled going forward? Will students and educators have to report possible cases? And is there a threshold when a school would have to close down again? I'll start with that, and then somebody can help me out. But uh, as you remember from uh, the college presentation, and uh, Rick Levin, this is probably a month ago, uh, those colleges had a, um, a fallback position in the case of COVID infection. They had a quarantine area where people could go. In the case of uh, elementary and high school, uh, my suspicion is, A, due to cohorting, we would know who had been in contact with that infected person, and we could uh, quarantine that class for a period of time. Correct, and uh, also we're going to be working uh, to look at community spread, not only in the schools, but in the community. And if it's felt that the cases in the community are such that it would require a ramping down, uh, it would be recommended. So we're going to be basing it on community trends, but also uh, attendance trends within our schools. And also just in terms of the elementary school with group events, whether it's chorus or band, arc, field trips, such as that, how would those be handled? We're looking at providing uh, further guidance with specific courses such as uh, chorus where we know students when they're singing they may be either facing each other or particles may be more likely to spread uh, in the air when you're singing. Uh, so we're going to be providing more guidance on that uh, in conjunction with our Department of Public Health and with input from uh, music and chorus teachers. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. I guess we're waiting for some of the finer details to be released on Monday, but in the meantime, how does this plan account for the 43% of teachers who earlier this month said that they are at high risk for the coronavirus and they expressed some concerns about returning? We plan on communicating the plan Monday. I, this is the plan here today, but we plan on communicating the details and uh, know that the plan does include safeguards for teachers, for all staff, for paraeducators, for uh, school leaders so that they should feel comfortable and safe in the uh, learning environment. Um, uh, keep in mind that the data that uh, we had a month ago or two months ago was also uh, greater in Connecticut. What, we, what we're doing is predicting forward two months given the data that we have, and I think it's pretty good. It's actually some of the best data in the state, in the country. And, and logistically speaking, you know, how do we get some of the younger children to comply with, with the masks of wearing those things or even like the special education students who may not be able to socially distance or even wear the masks. Right. A combination of mitigation strategies uh, is the best approach. So we know that wearing masks is difficult for young children, especially in the beginning, but we have to uh, work to give them the strategies to do it and, and work with them. Kids are resilient, kids will pick up on things, and we feel that that's a strategy that we need to employ to make sure that in combination with the others, we're providing the best environment for learning and for working. News 8. 
Hey, Governor Shana Ferrero with News 8 here. Uh, just wondering, when you had mentioned in the beginning of the presser, you talked about uh, this idea that parents may not feel comfortable in sending their kids. Um, how, what, are you, what are your thoughts on dealing with parents that may refuse or think that they should keep their kids home for you know homeschooling purposes? Are you prepared to deal with that those influx, that influx of parents that may decide that? So yes, you know this kind of goes to the question before also. It's really important that we communicate what our strategies are to lessen the, the fear, to lessen the concerns. We have to make sure that we're communicating plans. And I think giving districts that opportunity to socialize their plans and get input from parents, obviously get input from teachers so that teachers feel comfortable with it, that's a critical next step to make sure that their voices are heard in the development of the local plans, but also communicating it. But where there are cases where parents choose not to send their uh, children to school, we need to be prepared in districts to provide a distance learning uh, experience for the students that keeps them engaged in learning. I'd only add to that that um, there's obviously a lot of natural anxiety in the middle of this COVID pandemic, and we've heard some of it from teachers, and you just referred to it, some parents as well. And that's why uh, Miguel has worked so hard working with every single stakeholder out there getting their best point of view as we try and give people a sense of confidence that we can do this and do this safely. I can tell you, uh, talking to a lot of teachers, yep, there's anxiety, but they also really miss those kids. They know the importance of the classroom experience. And I'm uh, pretty sure the overwhelming majority are gonna say, I wanna get back and be with those kids. And look, for those uh, parents who thought that uh, distance learning worked great and they want a little more time, we'll find ways to accommodate them. I think the vast majority are gonna say, let's get back to school. Fox 61. Hi, Governor. Zania Maldonado with Fox 61. Uh, my first question is for the commissioner. Uh, you mentioned when inside the school building, students will be required to wear face masks, except for if they have health conditions, or when teachers are providing instruction. Can you clarify that situation? And can you confirm, will face masks be provided for all students and staff? If... if ex Additional social distancing between students and the teacher is, is possible. It, it is possible that uh, teaching can happen without a face covering. Um, in many cases, districts are already discussing providing uh, some form of uh, plexiglass barrier on the desk so that if uh, the teacher is sitting and talking to students, they can do that behind that. Um, outside, students can take off their masks. Obviously, mask breaks are going to be a part of the vernacular in the fall, and it's going to be something that I'm sure uh, every teacher is going to have for their students. Uh, so for the students that are medically fragile, uh, we, we know that it might be less healthy for them to wear a mask, so we would uh, provide that exemption. And then, Governor, you mentioned you will have an actual budget soon when school districts come up with specific plans. But does the state have an estimated overall price tag yet? You know, we really don't. We, we've got our COVID relief funds, and uh, some of that is available for education, making sure that our schools can accommodate changes necessitated by the COVID virus. But that's why uh, Miguel is going to be getting out to all the superintendents, what these metrics are, give them some time to come back, see what the space needs, et cetera, are at that school, and we'll be able to put together that budget in the next uh, three or four weeks, I hope. Thank you. CT News Junkie. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so my question is, what information do we have about how successful or not successful um, the remote learning was during these, these past three months? We conducted a, uh, a survey to districts on the level of connection um, and engagement with students uh, to help drive our decisions with regard to closing the digital divide. And that told us that there was a level of disengagement that we knew affected the ability for students to engage. Um, we heard anecdotally from some students that while academically they were able to connect, the distance learning prevented the socialization that they needed. In some cases, academically it worked fine without too many hiccups. Um, in other cases, it was sporadic and it was difficult for students to get on or even to have access to, to technology. So a second round of this will require that we continue to focus on the digital divide and giving access. 
Um, are there plans to address um, the lack of access um, for students in, if we need to go to the alternative and to go back to remote learning? Yes, there are plans underway. In the last month in Connecticut, we developed a Connecticut Learning Hub, which is content for districts for, for all students in Connecticut. We're gonna be launching that within the next week or two to give access to districts to have some of those materials that they need to support students. We're focusing our CARES funds uh, on equity of the digital divide, so connectivity devices. We're asking districts to focus their CARES funds on that. GEAR funds, uh, so the Governor's uh, Education Relief Funds, we're also looking at how we can utilize that fund to close the digital divide. That's a finite number in Connecticut. We have 530,000 students, and we believe that based on the data that we got from the survey, that it is a manageable goal to try to close that digital divide in this upcoming school year. Um, can you release the results of that survey? Definitely. Okay, thank you. I would just add on that, Christine, because it's a, a really good question. My experience, anecdotal as it may have been, was that um, the distance learning worked pretty well, especially from the kids' point of view. They adapted to it pretty quickly in places where they had good access, be it they had internet access and they had the necessary a Chromebook or other device. So as Miguel was saying, um, look, there's nothing that replaces the classroom experience, but I have a feeling going forward in Connecticut and across this country, you're gonna have much more of a hybrid. And uh, in the meantime, for those that don't feel comfortable going to school, we're gonna find out who they are and make sure they get access to the uh, Scholastic, the internet, and the uh, PC they may need to get that access. The Hartford Current. Hi, Governor. Um, when it comes to implementing safety procedures or rebuilding space to expand social distancing, will school districts have to foot the bill themselves beyond what they can receive from the CARES Act or FEMA? Well, let's see what the budgets come back with. Um, you know, we don't have an infinite amount of money, but we're there to be supportive and do what we can to help. And we'd like to think they'll work as much as they can within the existing classroom. You've got some schools that are more crowded. They'll be probably looking at cafeterias, gyms, and other open space that we may be able to retrofit for overflow class. That'll require some capital expense, and we'll be there to help. One more question. Uh, the CDC director, Robert Redfield, said that he didn't think there was clear evidence to support the public health value of requiring a quarantine for visitors from hotspot states. What's your response to that? What, discouraging people from an area that has a 40% infection rate, so uh, usually uh, asymptomatic coming into our state, he doesn't think that would have great value. He, he thought it had value when the shoe was on the other foot and uh, Florida was uh, quarantining uh, Connecticut a few months ago when we had the fire, you know, infection rate. Keep politics out of it. Thank you. The Day of New London. Hi, thank you. Uh, I know you mentioned that it would be more challenging uh, to group students and cohorts at the high school level. Um, so I wondered if um, there will be any additional safety precautions for um, high school students since they um, won't all be in, kept into uh, individual groups. High school students uh, are more likely to be able to keep masks on regularly. Uh, high schools are bigger and they have more open spaces. So we're gonna be looking at how we use social distancing in the high schools. Classrooms tend to be a little bit bigger um, and we're gonna have to be creative in how we uh, move students around uh, and how we move uh, the staff around instead of students. So we're gonna look at hallways, how we're passing between classrooms, how we're uh, having students eat. And in the, especially in the first three, four months, of, uh, first two to three months of school, we're gonna to try to use outside spaces as much as possible with high school st students as well. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Hello, thank you. I'm curious about the class sizes. Um, right now, things are going well in Connecticut and that these recommendations seem to be made with that assumption for the opening in the fall. I'm wondering if class sizes will be reconsidered if um, community spread starts again. Definitely. Uh, so, you know, we're fortunate in Connecticut because of the success we've had, uh, because every, everyone's commitment to uh, promoting those safety uh, mitigation strategies of wearing masks and keeping distance and staying home uh, during those months. 
we're able to promote a plan now, two months before, again, remember, we're predicting two months out, a plan that has all students in. But part of our plan in Connecticut is also to know when to ramp down, which means that we're going to reduce the number of students in the classrooms as needed, and ultimately, if, if the data suggests, go back to a full distance learning or full remote learning uh, strategy. And, and then the, the other question that I have is about what happens if teachers don't feel comfortable returning to school either because they're the primary caregiver of someone who is elderly and vulnerable or they themselves have a precondition. Um, is there going to be any exemption for those individuals? You know, accommodations where possible are going to be made uh, for, for staff members that identify that that's an issue. Um, but we've also, we also know many, you know, the safeguards that are going to be put in place are intended to keep everyone safe. Uh, I think, you know, we want to build the confidence of what we have, and we want those teachers to be a part of the process, and in, in, in addition to uh, the other stakeholders, to make sure that the plan, they feel comfortable with it. But ultimately, you know, we've heard from many other teachers who said that they want to go back to school, and they feel they're ready to go back. Thank you. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. This question is for the governor. Um, today, union leaders and nursing home long-term care workers are calling for the removal of Barbara Cass at DPH on the basis that she has failed to properly oversee nursing homes and safety protocols during the pandemic, putting both workers and residents at risk. Uh, what's your response to their demands? And do, does the governor's office or DPH intend to remove Barbara Cass from her position? No, I think... Um... She inherited a really hard job overseeing all these nursing homes right in the middle of a pandemic, doing everything she could to keep them inspected, make sure they're following the protocols, make sure they were getting the PPE that they needed. And uh, I think she um, operated heroically. So I'd be happy to talk to um, Labor about that. Paul, anything to add? I think you, you said it perfectly clear, uh, sir. Um, DPH, um, under Barbara Cass' leadership, uh, took on a very tough job. Um, have done it um, as strong as they can be. Uh, Barbara Cass personally, as we know, uh, went out to nursing homes to do inspections in the middle of the night, um, and she's someone who has served as a long-standing public servant in the state of Connecticut. And so uh, we look forward to continually having Barbara Cass as a member of our administration. May I add to that, Governor? Please. Um, uh, I'd like to also voice my support uh, for Barbara Cass. Uh, while I completely uh, understand the concerns of our nursing home workers and at the Department of Public Health, we do everything we can to support them in distributing PPE and working with the nursing home operators to make sure that they have adequate PPE to conducting over a thousand inspections in nursing facilities to make sure that their uh, infection control processes are adequate and that their staff have the PPE that they need. Um, Barbara has been an integral part of all of that, and she has been also instrumental in setting up our COVID recovery facilities uh, to make sure that there was a safe and well-staffed uh, uh, well place for, in the height of the pandemic, for individuals being discharged from hospitals who needed to go to a nursing facility, that they had a place to go that was especially equipped to manage the complications of COVID. Barbara was a key part of that strategy. So while I uh, very much support our uh, heroic nursing home workers, I also want to say uh, that the State Department of Public Health supports Barbara Cass 100%. And on um, the comments about having proper PPE, these long-term care workers, many of whom are people of color, they claim Cass's previous actions and comments, specifically calling the use of trash bags for protective gear as a preference among workers, are evidence of systemic racism. What's your response to that union's claim? Do you know about that? I'll be happy to take that one. Uh, I think there was a comment dealing with the fact that Barbara Cass was doing her statutory, statutory duty to, to investigate every claim that came forward to DPH, which she did and which she provided answers to, not only to the nursing home providers, but also to those individuals who were wearing uh, 
those trash bags. I, I think as uh, Commissioner Gifford has stated, we will always stand by our nursing home workers and the heroic work that they have done. At the same time, we're going to stand by Barbara Cass and the heroic work that she's also doing on behalf of the state of Connecticut. Thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thank you. Um, how is remote learning going to work for parents who don't want to send their children to school? I, I can't imagine that a teacher who's teaching an in-person class is also going to be doing remote learning at the same time. Uh, are you going to be assigning different staff members to provide instructions to those students? So depending on the number of students whose parents elect not to send them to the schoolhouse, uh, that will determine what strategies districts will take. Uh, at this point, uh, districts are asked to come up with a plan that in incorporates uh, distance learning for those students whose parents choose not to send their children. Um, but depending on the numbers, uh, it could be that uh, a staff is devoted to doing that for the entire district if the number is low. Uh, and I, I think I'm going to let districts weigh in on that. They know their communities best and they know their needs best. But I think part and parcel with that is the communication to families of uh, what they're doing in the classrooms and how uh, the strategies that they're uh, implementing are keeping students uh, safe. And um, the state's looking at least uh, at a deficit north of $2 billion, uh, Governor. How will the state be able to uh, supplement uh, any federal funds um, if, if you need? I, I'm just wondering, you know, is the state going to have state funding available to help these school districts out um, when you're looking at a deficit that huge? Uh, the answer is yes. As you remember, Paul, um, we did get um, a significant amount of money for the COVID relief fund from the federal government that goes to COVID-related expenses, education, retrofit education, preparing those kids is specifically part of that mission. So there will be some money over and above our normal ECS to help um, help our schools power through the COVID crisis. Okay, and I've just got a final uh, reader question, I guess, for, for uh, the governor, uh, Josh Jabal and Commissioner Gifford. And it's uh, what new and improved plans have been considered for uh, the possible resurgence of COVID-19 in the fall? I know Josh spoke about the, the PPE stockpile the other day. Josh, you wanna take that? Yeah, um, no, it's a great it's a great question, Paul. Thank you for that. We we actually, in the midst of all of the reopening activities, all of the continuing efforts to ramp up testing, contact tracing, all of the things that we're doing right now, we do have a group of commissioners who are meeting um, to look at scenarios around di different resurgence possibilities and the actions that we would take. So, we are in the midst of um, you know a, a moment in time where we're fortunate to have very good metrics here in Connecticut. We're very focused on trying to keep it that way, um, doing some contingency planning to ensure that we're ready if uh, we do need to take action in the future. Uh, Commissioner Gifford? Yes, I would add a, a couple of things to what Josh and, and the governor offered. Uh, first of all, we are in a much, much different place uh, today than we were back in March. Um, in, in terms of personal protective equipment and testing are two of the key differences but also the, uh, the medical knowledge that we have, that our healthcare providers have about how to care for COVID uh, is, is uh, evolving and changing and improving every day. Our nursing facilities uh, have been um, working very, very hard to prevent infection from coming back. Most of them are seeing very, very low numbers of uh, new infections. We are testing our nursing home workers we're testing our nursing home residents. We're also testing in our correctional facilities. And so uh, we are um, really in a much different place in terms of preparation than we were um, in March because uh, the, the, you know, the things that needed to be in place uh, weren't necessarily available across the country. And uh, Connecticut has done a particularly effective job in making sure that we have those things in place now in preparation for a potential second wave. But I would be remiss if I didn't add that um, it, there is a certain amount of uh, preventing a second wave, which is in our hands. 
And that has to do with our uh, continuing to keep our guard up and wearing masks, keeping our social distancing, staying away from crowds. Uh, if we're older or have uh, underlying conditions, remain at home as much as possible. All the things that Connecticut residents have been doing so successfully and so um, effectively, which result in that, uh, that really nice to see green color on the map that the governor showed, all of those things, if we persist, will help us prevent a second wave. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. The Associated Press. Uh, thank you, Max. Good afternoon. Um, I was curious, uh, Commissioner, regarding uh, the school reopenings. I know at one point there was talk about uh, students coming back to school in shifts, like different times a day. I wondered, is that still an option? So the reopening plan that we are asking districts to complete uh, must include a plan that allows for students to come in daily, given the uh, health trends in Connecticut. There may be a need for an alternative plan that uh, has some hybrid model, what we're calling a hybrid model, that might have shifts or A days and B days if the health data uh, requires it. And that would be as a result of uh, ramping down of where we are with regard to spread. Currently in Connecticut, our data is showing that we're reducing spread and it, there is no uncontrolled uh, spread. So we feel confident that districts should plan for a fall reopening with students coming in daily. And Governor, I was hoping that, I know you talked about this earlier today at the airport, but I was hoping you could provide some more specifics about how Connecticut can actually really enforce this tri-state quarantine. Uh, Governor Murphy in New Jersey today, for example, was talking about how vehicle stops are off limits constitutionally. I mean, what are your options and when might those kick in? Um, we were at Bradley Airport just a few hours ago. We showed uh, the signage that's up there, electronic and physical, saying if you're coming in from one of these designated states, you must self-quarantine for 14 days. Uh, we've already reached out to the um, hotel association. They've gotten that notice. That's going to be clearly uh, delineated for them as well. We reached out to travel agents so they in turn can um, tell people who are thinking about coming to Connecticut. They're coming from one of those very highly infected areas. They know what the rules are. And as, as you know, Sue, I mean, we have not had the heavy hand of enforcement. We've generally um, worked with self-voluntary uh, enforcement, and that's worked pretty well when it came to our safe schools, safe stores, um, uh, wearing the mask. Uh, Connecticut's done pretty well. I'm hoping we can reinforce that with people that want to visit our state in the same way. But what might be the tipping point, Governor? I mean, you're, you're talking about people that are coming from other states who might not be as amenable as maybe Connecticut residents are. For me, the tipping point would be if I find out that there's a lot of people coming from one of these very infected states and they're all staying at several hotels where nobody's asking the questions. Uh, they're all coming up on one airline where nobody's noticing these people that we then go to that hotel with our public health department and say, you're on notice. These people are not supposed to be staying here. They're supposed to be self-quarantining. And if you let them out, uh, I think you should be partly responsible for that. I'm sorry to keep asking this, but what does that mean, though? I mean, what can you do to that hotel? Um, let's take it one step at a time. Right now, I think you're going to find that a lot of people are who are maybe thinking about flying to Connecticut from Miami Beach or, um, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth are going to take a pause. They know it's unsafe for them to come here, and we know that right now that we want them to quarantine for 14 days. I think most of them will be staying at home, and that's what I want to have happen. Thank you, Governor. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm wondering if um, many summer schools this year stayed virtual because the rules seem too restrictive to work. Are you confident the fall plan's going to work? And do you think that the fall plans were shaped by uh, the reaction to the summer school restrictions? The summer school plan was developed the last week of April. And if you recall, that was when we were at the height of infection in Connecticut. And late April, we had to predict until July. And we used the safeguards that we felt at that point, again, with input from public health experts, would be uh, 
needed. What we know now in Connecticut, so much has changed since late April. Uh, what we know now is if we continue the trajectory, we're able to provide uh, a safe and a learning environment for students with the safeguards that we identified. You know, I, I want to make it clear, we're not going to school prior to COVID. Uh, we're still going to have many restrictions. It's not going to be exactly the same as it was before. I, I want to make that clear, but we know that getting back into the schoolhouse is not only good for students' academic and social emotional well-being, but in many cases it's the safest place and the most structured place that, that they have. Okay, a second question I have um, probably for the governor, is there a mechanism in place to protect school districts if, um, if students and staff are compelled to return and they get the virus? Is there any legal protection for the school districts in that case, say they're sued? I think they have some um, natural le uh, public legal protections right there. We take care of uh, anybody in that situation, not only free testing, free treatment, quarantine, a uh, place to stay, uh, that's for sure. In terms of the legalities of a suit with a school, um, probably have to get back to you, but I think there's a general immunity for the schools. Am I right about that? We know that the safeguards that we put in place were intended to make sure we're addressing risks. And um, we, again, we're putting a plan together. Schools, you know, as a former building principal with a playground, you know, there were cases where kids fell off and got hurt. And, you know, as long as we're following the plans that we have, uh, to keep students safe, uh, the, the risks are reduced. Thank you. That seems to be it for Max. I just, um, a lot of questions about are you confident the teachers are going to come back? Are you confident the students to come back? Um, I think what we have done is done everything we could to build your confidence uh, working with Miguel. We tried to give indications from our public health experts, had all the stakeholders involved along the way to give you the confidence that uh, we can get your kids back to school uh, safely. And uh, that's what we're trying to uh, do today and going forward. I'm less confident about where COVID goes. I know, um, I know the state of Connecticut. I know we've been following the protocols pretty safely. Uh, as you know, I do worry about um, these flare-ups. I see what's going on around the rest of the country. Let's control what we can control. I think we're going to be okay this fall. Thanks, everybody.